ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the NIADA Executive Committee and the dealers they represent across the country, here to open the 68th Annual NIADA Convention and Expo, please welcome to the stage NIADA's new Executive Vice President, Steve Jordan. Well, good morning and welcome to Las Vegas. My name is Steve Jordan, for those of you who don't know me. And on behalf of the NIADA Executive Committee, as your new Executive Vice President, it is my pleasure to declare that NIADA's 68th Annual Convention and Expo is now officially open. So we're really excited that you're here and I wanna personally thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules as dealers, I know life can be challenging, especially uh, you know in this day and age, but I do wanna personally thank you for taking time out and being here with us in Las Vegas this week. We've got a jam-packed agenda for you. Uh, you're, it's gonna be full of dealer training, uh, industry analysis, updates from federal regulators, legislators. We've got two tracks of educational training for you, uh, designed for retail dealers, designed for buy here, pay here dealers, but we've also got a third track for compliance. And it's, it's contained with seven different compliance sessions uh, that are gonna be held by the industry's best attorneys. And, and I think that's an important component when you talk about compliance, to be trained by the best industry attorneys uh, that we have around. Uh, they're not consultants. Um, so they're going to give you advice on how you need to be compliant in this day and age of compliance. So by attending each one of those uh, compliance sections, you can get a certificate of attendance. And if you complete all seven of them, you'll get a certificate of completion uh, suitable for framing. Uh, but this week, you're going to hear a lot about compliance. You're going to hear about compliance management systems. You're going to hear about complaint resolution programs. Um, and how you need to be responsive to consumer complaints and the needs and wants of your consumers. A little bit later this morning, you're gonna hear from the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We've invited their new director, uh, Jeff Longer, who's their assistant director of Office of Installment Lending and the Collections Market to join Sean Peterson, our regulatory counsel, for a sit down discussion on what's going on with the CFPB. He's gonna make some opening remarks and then he's gonna take questions directly from the audience because they wanna hear from you. And believe me, I know we wanna hear from them. There's a lot of questions these days about compliance and specifically how it relates to the CFPB. Uh, at lunch today, we're gonna to hear from United States Congressman Roger Williams, who's the representative from the 25th District in Texas. He's a car dealer, has been a car dealer for 40 years and he took the leap to join uh, the ranks of, of Congress uh, on behalf of small business. And he's got a lot of great things to say and he's gonna tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a car dealer in a dysfunctional Congress. So that's gonna be an interesting deal. Uh, you're also gonna hear a lot about the US economy and how the dysfunction in Washington DC is affecting finance markets. Uh, you're gonna hear from industry experts like Ken Shilson with the National Alliance of Buy Here, Pay Here Dealers you're gonna hear from Justin Friedman on the same panel. He's a government affairs director from the American Financial Services Association. And they're gonna talk about prime and subprime auto finances. Um, but you'll also hear directly from CEOs and top executives from major automotive finance companies that serve our industries. Uh, guys like Brian Geithner, who's the president of Nexgear Capital, Martin Less, president and CEO of Nationwide Acceptance, Jonathan Levine, president and CEO of Turner Acceptance, Brad Fleener, uh, the GM of Walters Kluwer, Joe Keitel, Vice President at AFC, uh, Mark Vasquez, Senior Vice President at Westlake Financial. We've got a, a power-packed panel uh, that's gonna talk about um, some insight into how the economic recovery and the expanding role of the CFPB and the FTC is affecting dealers and their access to capital. There's gonna be a lot of horsepower on that panel and you're not gonna to wanna to miss it. We're also gonna give you access directly to the capital markets. We've got a finance lenders fair this afternoon from 2.30 to 5, where we wanna connect you 
with finance companies who are in fact open for business and looking to do business with dealers directly. There's been a lot of misconceptions about the finance markets over the last few years. Uh, are, the, are the finance markets tightening up? Are bankers you know, cracking down? Are they not lending money anymore? I can assure you that is not the case. Finance companies, especially those that serve the automotive industry, are open for business and they wanna do business with you. So we wanna take some time this afternoon and, and bring those two components together and give you access to capital that you need to continue to grow your business. Then tonight, um, from five to eight o'clock, we'll have the grand opening of our sold out expo. We've got 125 companies that provide state of the art products and services directly for the automotive industry. Um, that's gonna be an exciting time. When you're registered, you probably got some drink tickets. So take those drink tickets now. They're only good for tonight. So take them down, enjoy the, the reception. Um, and if you run out of tickets, go and talk to a vendor. They'll be happy to give you some more. We've got a scavenger hunt in the Expo Hall every single day, $500 today, $500 tomorrow, and $1,000 on Thursday. And then we've also got in your packets, you may have seen them, we've got some attendee surveys. Attendee surveys that will allow you to tell us how we're doing to build a conference that meets your needs. We truly wanna hear from you and let us know how we're doing and things that we can do uh, to provide a better convention experience for you. And believe it or not, that's all just today. So Wednesday, we're gonna hear from Alan Smith, the Executive Vice President and COO of Auto Trader. He's gonna have a really cool interactive session on understanding today's automotive customer. You're not gonna wanna miss that. And then that's gonna be followed by Bobby Bowden, our motivational speaker who you may know as the winningest coach in NCAA football history, go Knowles, for those of you who are a Knowles fan. And that's sponsored by Carfax, our dear friends there. Uh, thank you guys. Um, and then Wednesday night, we've got our leadership awards banquet. And this is our opportunity as an industry to give back. We're gonna award $24,000 in scholarships to deserving students in our partnership with uh, Northwood University and autotrader.com. And then we're gonna announce our community service award winner in our, with our partnership with Mannheim. And, that, and, and a lucky dealer who's given back to the community is gonna walk away with another $5,000 to invest back in their community uh, to, the, to the charity of their choice. And then our time-honored traditions with the Ring of Honor, Lifetime Achievement Awards, and, and other association awards recognizing the best and brightest leaders within our industry. Um, Thursday, more dealer training and um, and then in the Expo Hall on uh, Thursday at one o'clock, we're gonna auction off um, on behalf of Odessa, AFC, and IAA, they've donated a 2011 BMW 328XI, uh, 27,000 miles white premium package. And, and I think they're selling a green light, right? I think it's green light, yeah. So uh, post, there, there may still be a post-sale inspection that you know, might need to be involved, but no, but seriously, um, our dear friends are donating this car on behalf of the foundation. So all the proceeds are gonna go to benefit our foundation and by extension, all the students um, and all the charitable contributions that, that we serve every year. Speaking of time-honored traditions, each year during our convention, we hold our annual board of directors meeting and we install our executive committee members for the upcoming year. And at this time, I'd like to recognize the 2014-2015 NIADA Executive Committee members that have made a commitment to, for this year and beyond to not only serve the NIADA, but to serve you as dealers in our industry. So at this time, I'd like to recognize the Chairman of the Board, Keith Hagler, from Taylor Auto Credit in Taylor, Texas. Keith, if you would stand up and remain standing. Our president, Arlen Keene from Keene Auto Sales in South Sioux City, Nebraska. Frank Fusi, Century Motors of South Florida, Pompano Beach, Florida. Our secretary, Gordy Tormelin from Tormelin Motor Sales, Freeport, Illinois. Our treasurer, Andy Gabler, Lakeside Auto Sales, Erie, PA. Our Senior Vice President, Billy Threadgill, Vans Auto Sales, Florence, South Carolina. Billy. 
And the next four people I'm going to introduce you are our regional vice presidents, but I want to take pause here for a second and tell you that the role of the regional vice president is to be your voice to the NIADA on behalf of the state associations and our local dealers and members. So it, this is a mechanism by which we can allow for feedback directly from you. If you see something that the NIADA is doing well, uh, this is your, these are your conduits to communicate. If you see something that you want to make a recommendation, you think we could do something better, we want to hear from you. And our regional VPs are, have dedicated their time and their energy to working, again, on behalf of our industry on a regionalized basis. So Region 1 Vice President, I'd like to recognize Lou Tedeschi from ASPI Motorcars and Dedham, Mass. Lou? Region 2 Vice President, Henry Mullinax, Mullinax Auto Sales, Anniston, Alabama. Our Region 3 Vice President, Scott Allen, Auto Land, Haltom City, Texas. And our Region 4 Vice President, Joe McCloskey, McCloskey Motors, Colorado Springs, Colorado. So if you would, give these guys one final round of applause and thank them for their service. We really appreciate it. So the other thing I want to point out about our executive committee is the fact that everyone, and, and I owe this actually to Mike Lynn. This is a, an unwritten rule that he put into place many, many years ago. But for, and it's, a, it's an unwritten rule, but I think it's a good one. But everyone on the executive committee has served at the local and the state level and at minimum has been the president of their state association at one point or another. So we feel like it's important at the national level to have a, a, an executive committee that understands the value and the operational processes of what goes on at the state level so that we can better understand how to be effective for you at the national level. So that's an important understanding. So in my remaining time, I want to talk to you today a little bit about the NIADA where we're headed as an association, and a little bit about my perspective on how we're gonna get there. You know, in 1946, the NIADA founded itself as an association really out of necessity. Um, and since then, it's been an association run by auto dealers on behalf of auto dealers uh, in our industry. And today that tradition continues. But I wanna underscore, I want to underscore that this is your association. This is not my association. It's not the association for our executive committee. It's your association, and we, and we serve on behalf of and want to represent the views and opinions of our members as best we can. You know, in the lead up to my current position as your executive vice president, I had the good fortune of being a, a dealer principal and a partner with a JD Byrider location in Tallahassee, Florida. I uh, did that for about six years. And during that time, we sold more than 3,500 cars. We built a portfolio of $11 million um, and built a great business. But during that time, I talked to a lot of dealers. And then I went to the FIADA as their executive director uh, for a couple of years. And, and again, talked to more dealers, got a lot of great insight. And after that, um, I had the good fortune of working with Mike Lynn at the NIADA for a couple of years as the chief operating officer and now I'm completing my first year as your executive vice president. And through this entire time, I've really had a lot of great interaction and gotten a lot of good feedback from dealers about our association. Some of it good, some of it not so good. I heard about some things that you know, were doing great. I heard about some things that we could do better. But at the end of the day, the one thing that I take away is you guys have a lot to say. Um, and, and that's important, and I appreciate that. And I think that is a really good thing. But I personally believe that the NIADA has a responsibility and an obligation to our members, our allied industry partners, and our state associations to make sure that your input and your feedback is not only being heard, but responded to at the highest levels of government. I also personally believe that currently, the two single biggest priorities that NIADA is engaged in, and this is based on your feedback, is number one, we need and must continue to, to expand our, president, our presence in Washington, D.C. with federal regulators and elected officials so that they can understand more about how our businesses work and more about how the decisions that they're making on Capitol Hill will affect your business 
uh, even at the local level. Priority number two is growing NIADA membership through our state associations and making sure that these state associations and our affiliate network is growing and sustainable long into the future. Look, NIADA is a grassroots organization and we would be nothing without our state associations. And it's imperative that we make sure that our state associations and our membership are sustainable now and, and long into the future. So in response to a lot of the feedback that we've gotten uh, from our dealers, over the last several years, we've taken a lot of great strides to respond and be responsive to your feedback and look at ways that we can continue to expand our footprint in Washington, D.C. And for a couple minutes, I just want to talk about some of the initiatives that we've embarked upon, again, based on the feedback that you've given. Um, you know, in a second, we're going to bring out Santi Esposito and Sean Peterson, uh, who represent kind of the, the, the forefront of our legislative and regulatory activity. And they're going to talk in a lot more detail about what's going on. But in the last couple of years, we've really done a great job of doubling down on the voice that dealers have in Washington, D.C. We have, we have ongoing meetings with federal regulators, the CFPB, the FTC. We're meeting constantly with uh, congressional officials and elected officers, again, to communicate your voice and your concern. Santi's gonna talk a little bit about the MAP reauthorization bill, um, but this is an important bill because it talks about recall notices um, as it relates specifically to rental car companies, but also uh, there's some language that would seek to apply uh, recall information to dealers directly. And again, he's going to talk a little bit about that. But we've done a great job, I think, of, of really kind of reinserting our voice into Capitol Hill and Washington, D.C. Uh, and part of that strategy was to have a national leadership conference uh, last November, which we did for the first time um, in a number of years. NIADA went to uh, Capitol Hill for three days and we lobbied the Congress. We took 120 association leaders, dealers, all the way down to the grassroots level and we, we had 34 different uh, legislative meetings with senators, with congressmen, and Sean Peterson organized a series of updates from federal regulators that came directly to us and they gave us updates on, you know, from the CFPB, the FTC, Department of Justice, NIMBITIS, NHTSA, uh, the alphabet soup of federal regulatory agencies. Um, and it was, an, it was an impressive display of just who we are as an association. And um, we're going to do it again this year. Uh, we're going to be back in Washington, D.C. for our National Leadership Conference. There's a little bit of information in your packages about it. I think if you look on the Thursday tab in your program guide, it'll give you a little bit more information. But I would encourage you to come. I think it's important for you to be there, important for you to make your voice heard directly from, from your business. Nobody can tell your story better than you can, and this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, we also kind of dusted off the PAC fund a couple of years ago, and we've, uh, in, in part with uh, our PAC fund, partnered with NAAA, and we've, uh, National Auto Auction Association, and we've given money to uh, Joe Barton, who's the, the congressman from the 6th District in Texas, uh, Joe McKinley, who is the first district uh, representative in West Virginia, Bill Schuster, who is the uh, chairman of the transportation and infrastructure in the House of Representatives. He's from Pennsylvania 6, but he's an important piece of our relationship in, in Washington, D.C., because he's a chairman of that pretty powerful committee. There's not a lot of legislation that gets written that doesn't affect the auto industry that doesn't also go through his committee. So he's an important relationship to have. And then, like I said, today, we're gonna to hear from Roger Williams um, in, in our meeting uh, at lunch, and I think it's gonna be a, a pretty powerful deal. Um, we've also joined uh, what's called RAGA and DAGA, the Republican Attorneys General Association and the Democratic Attorneys General Association, in part because when you talk about the CFPB and you talk about the FTC, a lot of the enforcement mechanism that takes place happens through the infrastructure that's created by the attorneys general. So Sean Peterson's background is actually with the attorneys general office in Ohio. And I think he gives us a really interesting, good perspective in, in, a, in a boatload of relationships 
with attorneys general and their staff all across the country. But that's an important mechanism in the long-term approach that we're trying to create in, again, making your voice heard. Uh, we've, during our uh, legislative committee meeting at uh, the November meeting in DC, uh, we created a buy here, pay here task force. And this is, this is a task force that we created to really uh, create a, a more permanent voice for buy here, pay here dealers within our organization because frankly, there's a lot of moving parts related to the buy here, pay here industry, subprime, uh, lending, you know, it's, it's a completely separate dynamic. And of all the, the different niches within the industry, the buy here, pay here dealers feel like they have one of the biggest targets on their backs, specifically from the, FT, uh, from the CFPB. And um, so we feel like that's an important development. Uh, we've got our online dealer compliance training mechanism available for you at um, niadadealercompliance.com. It's an opportunity for you as a dealer to, to take the first initial steps into compliance. If you don't know where else to turn, this is a great starter point for you to get, uh, to get off, the, off the ground and running in that deal. And then additionally, we've got our, we've got our used car industry report, which we're announcing this year um, in collaboration with the NAAA we're, we're publishing their annual report in here as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a great one-two punch of information related to the used car industry and the wholesale and AAA industry. Um, and, and that's a good piece. But the one thing that I wanna point out about the used car industry report that we've added this year is a, um, a quarterly business confidence survey. So we started thinking, well, look, what is, you know, you, you hear a lot about compliance and, and how dealers have to be responsive. And DNADA just recently released a study that showed the cost of compliance for new car dealers on an annual basis is about $3 billion. That translates into about $184,000 per employee. So the cost of compliance is a, is a, cre a key critical component that small businessmen and women have to factor in every day. But one of the things that we wanted to do was take a, a better snapshot of what are you thinking and what are you feeling as a small business owner in your community? And in the first, uh, the first iteration of data from this survey, we found that 53% of respondents expected higher retail sales in the next quarter. So things are looking up. We think we're gonna sell some more cars, but Juxtapose that against 68% do not plan on expanding their businesses, and they don't expand. They don't plan on you know um, expanding their businesses with building or property. And additionally, 67% said they are not planning on hiring. So here you've got an environment where more more than half of the the dealers in the industry expect higher sales and expect larger revenues. Uh, but have no plans to expand and no plans to hire. Um, and, and I think that's an interesting position that we're in as an industry. And a lot of this is supported uh, by other industry surveys from AFSA and, and, and the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses. But there's a sense of uncertainty. And I don't know if it's a midterm election year uncertainty, if it's an economic recovery uncertainty. But additionally, in our survey, uh, we asked, what do you feel like the, the most important issue is related to small dealers and, and, and car dealers is today? And combined, 34.7% said economic conditions and government regulations are the two top priorities or problems that our industry faces today. So I think it speaks to the uncertainty out there when you've got a slowly recovering economy and you've got additional federal government and red tape that is working its way into your business, it doesn't, it doesn't create a lot of confidence. But part of the reason we put this business confidence survey together is so, again, we could create another mechanism to hear directly from you to tell us what you're thinking. What are you feeling? And I'll tell you, um, federal regulators and our elected officials, this is important information for them to understand. And we're gonna continue to make sure we find ways to be re more responsive to your feedback and input and leadership so that we can make your voice heard in Washington, D.C. and beyond. Also in the next 12 months, we're gonna be making strides to build 
and sustain our state association networks across the country and in our four regions. Uh, like I said earlier, the long-term growth of our state association network is an important component to how successful NIADA can be now and in the future. And as such, I would simply encourage you to find a way to be more involved in your state association. They're always looking for more feedback. They're always looking for more leadership and they would love to hear from you. In closing, let me simply say that this year's convention is one of the best conventions we've had in, in recent memory. A full 21% of attendees this year are first time attendees, and that's exciting. So I would, I would encourage you as new attendees to find your state executive director, find one of our uh, executive committee members, and figure out a way that you can be more involved beyond the walls of our convention. You know, with your continued feedback, participation, and leadership, the NIADA, I believe, is gonna grow to heights that we never dreamed possible. I truly believe that our best days are ahead and that we owe a great debt of gratitude to those who have served before us. Mike Lynn did a fabulous job of taking over the reins of the association at a time where we were faced with a lot of financial uncertainty. And he and a lot of the leaders that have served before us um, righted the ship and they weathered the storm and they got us to where we are today as an association. And I'm proud to say that the NIADA is stronger financially now than it ever has been. And we are looking forward to many great successes in the future, but we can't do it without your help and your feedback and your involvement. So anyway, thanks again for joining us this week. I really and truly appreciate you being here. And if there's anything that we can do during the course of the week to make your stay more enjoyable, I promise you our staff will make you feel right at home. Certainly let us know. But at this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage our next presenters to give us a more detailed report of the NIADA's legislative efforts in Washington, D.C. So please join me in welcoming NIADA Legislative and Regulatory Counsel, Sean Peterson, and NIADA's Washington, D.C. lobbyists with federal advocates, Santi and Michael Esposito. Guys? <laughs> That's great to be with you folks. It's great to have a full room. Thank you for being here. There has been a lot of activity, as you might imagine, going on in Washington, D.C. over the course of the last year. And moving forward uh, this year, particularly with an election year coming up, there's going to be increased activity as we uh, interact with our uh, elected and regulatory officials. We want to start by uh, having Santi and Michael give you a little bit of uh, an update of what's going on in Congress and uh, talk a little bit about the election as well. Santi. Thank you, Sean. Well, as Sean mentioned, this year is an election year in Congress. And in November, all the members of the House of Representatives, all 435 of them, and one third of the Senate, 33, are up for election. And obviously, the implications of that election are going to be significant in terms of what the next Congress looks like and what the priorities are. But it's also going to be significant for the association because it's going to impact on issues which uh, we are concerned about. So we're going to watch that um, uh, election very carefully. And as Steve mentioned, the, the um, DC convention um, is happening this year at a very timely uh, a point because it's going to be right after the election. So we'll be able to get in a, to talk at that point about the results of the election, what it means for the new Congress, and what it means for the uh, association. Let me give you a little flavor of the politics of Congress this year, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of substantive issues, and Mike's going to talk about uh, the highway bill. Um, it's it's inter interesting if you look at the political situation in Congress, because I would say that starting maybe back in December and then extending for two or three months, there was a, a bit of nervousness in Congress. The House Republicans were concerned that there would be something that would happen legislatively that might jeopardize uh, their majority in the House, and the Senate Democrats uh, were equally concerned that the same thing would happen on their side. So everybody low-keyed things in terms of legislative process. You didn't need to see any bills coming to the floor to repeal Ob Obamacare. You didn't see any initiative dealing with immigration reform. And then, I would say two or three months ago, things started to change a little bit, where both sides 
got a little bit more confident about holding on to their majorities, even though the situation in the Senate side is a little bit more tenuous than the House side. So they started getting into hearings that were a little bit maybe controversial, the situation with Benghazi, and now IRS, and the VA, and the latest thing is XMVAC, et cetera. And legislatively, they started to move appropriation bills. Um, and they have moved more appropriation bills this year than they have in the past. Not any of them have, have gone to, uh, to closure at this point, but most of them are well ahead of the process. And then came the primary election of Eric Cantor. And Congress has still not recovered from that situation. And you can look at that issue and, 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 and identify a number of factors why Cantor lost. I mean, Cantor was heir apparent to the speakership, 51 years old, and he could have gone beyond that um, as well. Um, now, was it a matter of the fact that um, he didn't go back to the district enough times? He was out doing national campaigning. Um, was it because he was raising a lot of money for other members and not focusing on his own district? Was it because the constituents assumed that he was going to be reelected so they didn't go out and vote? Uh, was it the polling that he was confident about, which turned out to be completely wrong? There are a number of factors, but I, what I believe was the major factor why he lost, and it was not necessarily the person who ran against him, because the person who ran against him had a $120,000 campaign chest and two staffers. Uh, and I don't think it matters whether it was Tea Party or, or whatever. I think the reason why he lost is because of the anti-federal government vote. And today, Congressman Cochran in Mississippi is also having a primary. He is a well-respected senior member of the Republican Party, and he's down in the polls. And so as a result of that, paranoia has set in the Congress, and everything has come to a grinding halt because everybody's nervous about doing anything that's going to turn off their voters. Um, so that's basically the political situation. In terms of some of the substantive issues, if you see our monthly reports, you know that we're monitoring a lot of bills. But I just want to mention a couple uh, that are percolating in different ways through the process. Um, there's a bill that has been passed by the House that has 70 co-sponsors in the Senate. Uh, and the chief sponsor in the Senate is the chair of the Committee of Jurisdiction, uh, which deals with the issue of privacy notices. Under existing law now, uh, financial institutions are required to mail to their customers on an annual basis a privacy notice, even if the privacy policy of, the, of that institution is not changed. What the House bill does, it says, when you have an initial arrangement with the customer, you have to provide the privacy notice. If you change your privacy policy, you have to, uh, you have to provide that to, to the customer again. But if your policy doesn't change, you don't have to send it out on an annual basis. That's what the House bill does. It passed the House. The Senate bill has the same requirements in there, but it adds a third provision. And that provision says that the financial institutions must make available on some electronic way or some other means that are, that's still yet to be determined so that customers can have access to the privacy notice. Um, we've looked at that bill. Uh, the association, working with Steve and with Sean, um, in concepts supports it. Um, if we had a preference, it would be the House bill and not the Senate bill. We've written a letter to that effect. We've talked to the House and Senate staff about that. Our concern about the Senate provision is that it's going to require members to have a website or some other device to, yet to be determined so that you can provide notice to your customers. Does that put a burden on us? What does that look like? We don't know. Um, and so we'll just have to see if, uh, how that unfolds. At the same time, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, has issued regs on that very issue. Sean is monitoring that process. They're out for comment. Uh, the comment period is, is now extended into July, and Sean's going to be reviewing those for comments by the association. Uh, the other issue I want to mention legislatively has to do with the House Financial Services Committee what I call a strange series of events. I've never seen this before. But starting about a month ago, a bunch of bills were introduced in the House dealing with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Bills that were introduced that had no sponsors, uh, bills that had no companion bills on the Senate side, 
bills that went to hearing days after they got introduced, bills that went to markup uh, days after the hearings, bills that were in draft form and not even introduced yet as bills were heard and marked up. And all, all this flurry of activity. Um, and, and we reviewed all the legislation. Before I talk about the substance of the legislation, apparently, you know, the House Republicans hate CF, CFPB in the room. <laughs> they, they hate the CFPB. If they had their druthers back in the days of Dodd-Frank when they were not in the majority, CFPB probably wouldn't be in existence today. So they're looking at every opportunity to kill the agency. Uh, outright repeal, doing it in, in ways with separate bills which try to rein in the authorities of the CFPB, which is the basic thrust of these bills, um, or trying to kill it in the appropriation process. However, the, what is stopping that from happening is, is the Senate, and the majority in the Senate which supports the agency. And the House Republicans know that, CFPB knows that, but this activity is going on in the, in, in, in the House. Our sense is that what the game plan is, at some point they're going to package all these bills together in an omnibus bill, and they're going to bring it to the floor, and it's going to pass, but it's probably not going to go beyond that. So we've reviewed all of the pending bills. Again, Sean taking the lead on it because of his regulatory involvement. We haven't found any bill that we're opposed to. There are a number of bills that we don't have any position on, and there are a couple of bills that interest us. There's one bill, for example, that would set up a small business advisory board within the CFPB, and we think that's a good thing because the small business entities don't have a voice per se within that organization. And the other thing is if, if that bill happened, were to become law, we might you know, that would be something that we look, we look at in terms of, you know, participation or a membership on that advisory board. So we're watching that legislation. And uh, the, another issue, which we've seen in more than one bill, has to do with uh, CFPB's um, guidance and regulatory process. Um, and, and they have required in that legislation that when CFPB issues any guidance or regulations, they have to require a public notice and comment period, and they have to provide the underlying data or analysis or information that supports their final guidance or, uh, or, or rule. There have been a couple of issues that uh, come to Congress' attention where CFPB has not done that. They have made a decision, and they have sort of avoided uh, telling Congress on what basis that made that decision. So we're monitoring those bills. The last thing I want to mention before I turn it over to Mike is our approach in terms of advocacy on behalf of the association. You know, we work very closely with the executive committee, the legislative committee, and, you know, m more directly with, with Steve and Sean and Mike Lynn. And I think collectively that group, the team that I call it, you know, we're your eyes and ears in Washington. But you all, you all are the heart and soul of the advocacy effort in Washington, D.C because you are the constituents of all these members. And I'm telling you, it makes a great big difference when we are dealing with members or staff on the Hill to start the conversation off by saying, we're here on behalf of NIADA, 20,000 members strong. And oh, by the way, in your state and here in your district, we have the, we have the following you know, X number of members. And that resonates well with members of Congress. So when you all come to DC in, in, in in, in the fall and make those annual visits, it does make a big difference. I mean, because one of the important tools about advocacy is being visible, and that's a way of doing this. So we appreciate everything that you've done. We've turned to you in the past. We've turned to different segments of the association to weigh in with their members of Congress when we need their support at the grassroots level. We turned to you all to do, on the survey dealing with the rental car issue, and that was, that was very much appreciated. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk about the highway bill. Good morning. Um, the highway bill uh, in Congress, uh, many of you have possibly read about um, what's going on. It's a bill that's uh, typically a six-year bill. The last time the bill was signed into law was July of 2012. Uh, that bill was a two-year bill. The first time ever that it wasn't a six-year bill, it was a two-year bill. It was pretty much a fixed kind of bill. That bill expires September 30th of this year. So Congress is hard at work trying to put together a new bill um, that funds roads and bridges and, and everything else. So um, status of the bill. In April, President Obama released a bill, a uh, $302 billion bill, appropriately called the Grow America Act. Um, and and if, 
And if you know how things work, the White House can't legislate, so the White House sends the bill up to the Congress. Congress looks at the bill and, and then gets its direction and then kind of moves on its own from there. So the President has his bill, so the Senate then acts, and in the Senate, the highway bill is broken down into three committees of jurisdiction. The Environment and Public Works Committee, the Commerce Committee, and the Banking Committee. Different in the House, where jurisdiction for the highway bill falls under one committee, which is the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. So the three committees that have jurisdiction in the Senate, only one committee has acted, and that's the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. They released a six-year bill that was a $265 billion bill. So you have the President's bill that's out there, $302 billion. You have the Senate EPW, Environment and Public Works Committee, has a $265 billion bill. So now you're waiting for Commerce Committee to act, you're waiting for the Banking Committee to act, and then you're waiting for the House to act. So on the House side of things, they've proposed a one-year clean bill. So no changes to existing law, just a one-year extension of the current bill. So the biggest issue right now is the spending gap. Uh, many of you have probably heard that the, the Highway Trust Fund is running out of money. There's no more money to fund roads and bridges. And there's this panic in Congress to try and find $100 billion. There's a number of proposals that have been out there. You may have heard that one of the proposals that have gotten the most publicity is maybe closing the Postal Service on Saturdays, so no mail on Saturdays, and that would end up saving X amount of billions of dollars over a number of years, and they could use that to kind of offset the $100 billion that they're missing in a gap. So why is NIADA and why are we focused on the highway bill if we're talking about building roads and building bridges? Well, in the President's bill that he released in April, there was section 4109, and that dealt with recall issues and how car, used car dealers and rental car companies would work with cars that had recalls, uh, pending recalls out there. Um, so this is the first time we've ever seen language uh, written that specifically says used car dealers. It's always been applied to new cars or been discussed in terms of, of auctions, but this is the first time that we've seen the words used car dealerships written in. And at the same time, the language is written that it includes every type of recall. So not safety-related recalls, but every type of recall. So an example that we've been using on the Hill through this whole process is if your glove box won't lock or unlock, not that it's hanging out and hitting somebody's knee, but the fact that it won't simply lock or unlock is a recall issue. So you would not be able to sell or rent that car until that issue is taken care of. Um, so the Commerce Committee came to us. The Commerce Committee, again, is one of the three committees in, in the Senate who has jurisdiction over the highway bill. The Commerce Committee came to us and said, we're going to be dealing with the recall issue. Um, we've seen it in the President's proposal in his bill. Can you all react to this? Um, so we went back, put together some information. We supplied the Commerce Committee with a letter that tweaked the language that the President used in his bill. and focus primarily on safety-related recall issues. We wanted to get away from the entire encompassing of all recalls because those issues could be so small and, and insignificant that it would prevent you from moving a car off your lot um, when it was something purely simple. Um, so the, the timing of, um, of, the, of the bill itself before Eric Cantor lost his race, I would have been able to tell you uh, more simply when that bill would have moved, but now with the Cantor effect that we all use up on the Hill, nobody wants to vote for anything, nobody wants to move anything, and at the same time, if I'm a Republican in Congress and I have the inkling that maybe next year I'll control both the House and the Senate, why would I want to move a bill now uh, and have to compromise with a Democratic-controlled Senate? So they're probably push back on this, push away, um, punt it a little bit down the road, at the same time trying to come up with the $100 billion to, to get to where they need to to fund a bill of this magnitude. At the same time, there's an auction, auction sales issue that's also been in play. The FBI caught wind of some dealerships who were selling vehicles, then those vehicles were going down to Africa, 
vehicles were being sold, money was being sent to Hezbollah, and it all came back around to the FBI investigating the issue substantially uh, throughout the Hill and, and got a number of members of Congress involved in it. Um, we pushed back on that issue because the proposal on the table from the FBI and others was that when a car came in, when a car was traded in or a car was sold, that as the dealer you all would be responsible for taking 30 to 50 pictures of the car, supplying VIN numbers and other technical information that would then be made in a public system available for anybody to access and it would provide a substantial paper trail so they would be able to track that car wherever it goes, whoever buys it, uh, and then the money that moves on from there. Um, it would have put a substantial burden on dealerships in terms of being able to move cars. Um, so we worked with the FBI, we worked with members of Congress to make sure that they were okay with how things operate because again, a lot of what we do on the Hill is educational and we walk them through the steps that you all take when a car is traded in um, the secure steps and how taking 30 to 50 pictures of a vehicle and the time taken and needed to do that would not be a cost advantage to you all. It would, it would, it would be, a, it'd be difficult for you all to do um, and at the same time a burden. So we were able to push back on that. That issue has not risen up uh, in the highway bill yet, um, but we're keeping track of that and we're watching the highway bill move through the process, have our eyes on the recall issue, um, and again, working with committees and members of Congress. We're trying to tweak that language that it does not encompass all recalls, but, but specifically just safety recalls. Thanks, gentlemen. One of the things that uh, we want to kind of give you a sense of is, is how all this fits together. So you've heard uh, all this talk in, in the legislative process about recall issues coming up through, uh, through Congress. At the same time, the regulatory agencies are tackling this issue as well. So the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, is the regulatory agency that manages all of these manufacturer recalls. They're the ones that are uh, driving the manufacturers to get notice out to the consumers that their vehicle has a particular recall and needs to be addressed. When the uh, transportation bill was uh, passed and signed into law a couple of years ago, there was a provision in that bill that required NHTSA to develop a database that would allow anybody in the public to go and search by VIN any open recalls. As a result of that language, there's been a lot of activity at state legislatures to try to implement legislation that would uh, prohibit, very much like what the president has uh, submitted to Congress, prohibit the sale of a used vehicle with any open recall. Some of them are focused on safety recall, some of them address any open recall. And it's all of this idea that's percolating all throughout uh, the industry. Last summer, NHTSA passed a rule that will require the manufacturers, each of them, to have on their website uh, a searchable database where you as a, as a consumer or you as a dealer or anybody in the public for that matter can go and punch in a VIN number and see if there are any open recalls. And NHTSA will aggregate all of that information and put it onto its website, safercar.gov, again, for VIN-specific searches. What we're uh, anticipating as a result of that is, uh, that, that's supposed to be done by mid-August, by the way. Um, what, we're, what we're expecting as a result of that, a, a couple of states to probably go ahead and pass their legislation. And you know, part of me thinks that uh, one of them, a particular state of California that's had some, uh, some hearings on their bill here just in the last week or two, uh, may even try to get in front of Congress on this and, and be the first in the nation to pass that type of, of legislation. We uh, were certainly not opposed at all to the, to the idea of having a VIN-specific uh, uh, searchable database for the public and, and for you as dealers to go and check out those uh, safety recalls. As you might imagine, we have a lot of activity that's going on at the CFPB. I don't want to focus here in this session too much on that, simply because Jeff Longer, who is, uh, as Steve mentioned, the Assistant Director of Installment Lending and, and Liquidity Markets and Debt Collection fits under his responsibility as well. It's going to be here in the next session. So a lot of what we're going to talk about with Jeff are, are the types of things that uh, the CFPB has been engaged in over the course of the last uh, several months. But I can, t I can tell you that one of the things that has impressed me with Jeff is he's very open to comment. Uh, Steve and I had the opportunity to meet with him just weeks after he, uh, he assumed his new position. 
And even though there was a little bit of uh, you know, a learning curve, as you might imagine, when you're coming into a new position, he was very engaged in asking us questions and wanting to know about the industry and wanting to know about us uh, as an association in particular. So those are all positive developments. And I hope you'll obviously stick around for the session with Jeff and you'll get to hear firsthand some of the things that the CFPB is doing and the relationship that the association has with, um, with the CFPB. One of the things that is um, hot and heavy for all of the regulatory agencies, CFPB, uh, the FTC, Department of Justice, and at the state level is fair lending in the automotive uh, sector. Uh, last March, the CFPB released a, a document, uh, Sandy referenced, that uh, has, has been all the subject of all kinds of consternation in dealing with fair lending and discrimination in indirect auto lending. And uh, since that document has been released, members of Congress have been asking for information. The industry has been asking for more information. Other agencies have been asking for more information from the CFPB. We had the privilege in November of being asked by the CFPB to uh, attend and participate in a forum that they held and actually happened to be the same week we were in Washington, D.C. So we wrapped up our uh, leadership conference and the next day this forum took place. And uh, I can tell you that uh, none of that would have happened but for the efforts of, uh, of, of Mike Lynn and Steve Jordan, you as an association and making sure that you have a voice in Washington, D.C. as is represented on the stage. That's a very positive uh, development and we're hearing more and more, we're being asked to participate in these types of seminars and conferences and discussions and being reached out to on various issues. But back to the substantive issue, there's, there's just a, 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 a deep scrutiny on fair lending related issues. We're going to have a compliance based seminar this week talking about uh, some of the uh, specifics as it relates to fair lending. The Department of Justice has kind of taken that uh, fair lending issue to the next step and in conjunction with the North Carolina Attorney General's Office has filed a lawsuit against a buy here pay here dealer uh, alleging reverse redlining. And in essence what that means is it's a legal theory that um, addresses lending issues not from a we're not going to do business with you standpoint but the allegation is that uh, minorities are getting put into uh, different um, predatory pricing on their loans than majority customers would receive. One of the interesting uh, fact patterns about this case is the dealer is charging the exact same interest rate for everybody. So not quite sure personally how that, that theory works. There's a motion to dismiss that's pending in that case. The reason I bring it up for you is just to show you how aggressive the federal government and the state governments are being on these particular issues. Um, the FTC has had enforcement actions as it relates to these fair lending issues. The CFPB obviously recently settled with Ally and we'll talk a little bit more about that with Jeff and now this issue with the Department of Justice and the State Attorney General in North Carolina. These are things that, uh, that are, are hot and heavy right now. The FTC, uh, about a year and a half ago, released a, um, a proposed rule change to the used car rule that would affect the buyer's guide that po you post on your windows when you sell a car. That rule, we originally thought was going to be a pretty quick uh, turnaround from initial draft into final form. It's not happened yet, and there's been ongoing discussions with uh, the FTC, NADA, us, other consumer advocacy groups on the particulars of that uh, used car rule. One of the things I can tell you that's, that is uh, being discussed is the idea of providing some vehicle history report to customers when they uh, are there at the F&I desk and, and incorporating that into, uh, into the rule. One of the concerns that we've got with, uh, with that idea is the breadth of how a vehicle history report might be defined. The other concern that we've got is that used car rule and, and the buyer's guide window sticker was intended to be a warranty related document where you're disclosing whether or not you as a dealer are providing warranties. So the last thing we want to do is have that document turn into several different um, unrelated things and it loses its uh, original intent. But the idea of a vehicle history report being incorporated into that buyer's guide gives us some concern because we're not in control as dealers of the information 
that are contained in vehicle history reports. You know sometimes that that vehicle history report is going to change from the moment you may acquire a car before you sell a car. And those things are always in motion. The way that the used car rule is, is drafted and the language that you have to have in your uh, specific buyer's agreement with the customer is that the information in the buyer's guide gets incorporated into your contract. And any discrepancies in your contract you know, is going to be overridden by what's contained in the buyer's guide. So if we're incorporating vehicle history reports into the buyer's guide and then incorporating the buyer's guide into the vehicle, or excuse me, into the contract with the customer, we're concerned that by doing that, you're now becoming subject to anything that's, you know, subject to liability for anything that's contained in that vehicle history report. So the discussions are ongoing. I wish I could give you a timeline as when to expect uh, a final rule, uh, but this is an ongoing dialogue with the FTC and has been uh, ongoing for the better part of a year. One of the other uh, things that the FTC has been very aggressive on is advertising compliance. Over the course of the last two years, there's probably been about uh, upwards of two dozen enforcement actions taken against the dealers and manufacturers for advertising uh, related violations. In January, uh, the FTC announced a sweep of automobile dealers across the country from Massachusetts to California to Texas to Michigan, you name it, uh, where they found all kinds of violations of, of advertising regulations simply by sitting at their desk. Now, I'm not going to get into the particulars of that. Uh, we're, again, we're going to have a compliance uh, seminar this afternoon that addresses what you need to do um, to, in order to stay compliant in your advertising. But the reason that I bring that up is to, is to show you that that is a hot issue for the FTC. It's something that they don't have to put a lot of effort in to, quite frankly. They can sit at their desk and they can find internet advertisements, be it YouTube videos, be it your website, be it uh, newspapers that have online advertising uh, marketed on their websites. It's something that they're very aggressive on. In conjunction with that, uh, that sweep, there was a press conference held by Jessica Rich. And if you've been coming to these conferences for the last couple of years, you know that Jessica Rich came and spoke to us a couple of years ago. She's now the uh, Bureau of Consumer Protection head. She runs all the consumer protection uh, focus at the FTC. In her press conference, she made it a point to say, this is not the end. We have more in the pipeline, and they are coming. She didn't announce when, but there are more of these issues that, that uh, they're ready for enforcement actions, they're developing enforcement actions, and, and it's coming. So I want you to be aware of, of that. One of the other things that um, I think a message from coming from the FTC is, is we will work with you, we'll warn you on uh, particular issues, and then if you don't heed our warnings, we're going to rough you up, so to speak. You may recall uh, about a year ago, January, there was a, um, a sweep of dealers in the Jonesboro, Arkansas area where the FTC kind of descended with investigators into that area and just walked around the dealerships checking to make sure that those dealerships had the used car window stickers in the windows and that they were properly uh, and correctly completed. As a result of that sweep, they uh, released uh, letters that they had sent to roughly a dozen dealers uh, indicating to them that they were not in compliance with the rule, whether they were not posting them on their cars, period, or whether they were completing them incorrectly. They gave those dealers an opportunity to comply. Not too long ago, several months ago, the FTC sued one of those dealers that had received warning for continual violations of the used car rule. Again, not even putting the windows, allegedly, not even putting the window stickers uh, in, in the windows of the car. I can tell you that, again, this is a very easy issue to comply with, and it's a very easy thing for the FTC to walk on a lot and find that there are, you're either compliant or you're not. There's not much wiggle room either way. They're going to be looking for that uh, issue moving forward. Uh, two other quick uh, settlements that the FTC has had with, uh, with companies that aren't automotive related, but I think will give you a sense of where the FTC may move, moving, uh, move, uh, may move going forward. One is a settlement that they had last fall with Aaron's Rent-A-Center. Aaron's is one of these companies where you can go in, you can rent a TV, you can rent a couch, you can rent computers, uh, so on and so forth. 
With respect to their computer rentals, uh, some of the, the franchises that Aaron's has were uploading software that would do two things. One would monitor uh, the computer's activity, would look at the keystrokes that were being used, would look at the websites that are being visited, even turn the, the computers, if there was a webcam, turn that webcam on and would record what is going on in, in the room. Uh, th there's a couple of anecdotes that you might imagine that come as a result of that. But um, obviously there's, there's ire of the FTC that that's even on there, but the consumers weren't notified that it was on there. The second uh, component to that is there was a GPS tracking uh, mechanism into the computer to make sure that the computer was where it was supposed to be. As a result of this settlement uh, with Aaron's, there was a prohibition that the FTC put on Aaron's using any of this keystroking monitoring uh, software or hardware can't have it on there, period. That may not affect us very much. The other issue that they resolved with Aaron's is the use of the GPS tracking. They were okay with Aaron's having that mechanism on there, but they were not okay with the failure to disclose and get express permission from the consumer to have it on there. So there's a, some very specific things that they required of Aaron's, that there was a separate disclosure document, there, there needed to be a, a conspicuous disclosure of what it was being used for and, and, and so on and so forth, and the consumers had to sign off and acknowledge that it was there. Again, not automotive related, but there are plenty of us in the room that do use those GPS tracking systems on our vehicles, so we may see some activity as it relates to that in the automotive sector. I don't think that that is uh, far-fetched, and, and I suspect it's coming soon. The other issue uh, that was recently settled with uh, FTC and Time Warner involved the risk-based pricing rule. I always imagined that the first risk-based pricing settlement and enforcement case was going to be taken against a dealer or finance company. Turns out that it was Time Warner Cable. What Time Warner was doing was pulling credit reports of its customers as they would make an offer and if, if customer credit was at an appropriate level, uh, th those customers were not required to pay installation fees and they would get you know, activation waived and those sort of things. Um, if there were negative annotations on the credit, then they got a different deal. Time Warner wasn't sending out the risk-based pricing notices at all to these, to these customers for those offers. So, end result, we've got a violation of the risk-based pricing rule. We have a settlement that required Time Warner to pay $1.9 million civil penalty. So you can see, again, these, these rules that tangentially affect our industry are being enforced by the FTC and very aggressively, and the end result is, is often high penalties. As Steve mentioned, just last, uh, last thing that I wanted to bring up, as Steve mentioned, we've been active in working with the state attorneys general and we've seen a lot of positive results come of that. We've joined the Republican uh, State As Attorneys General Association and the Democratic State Attorneys General Association. And at, as a result of that, we're being contacted by state AGs to, a, to comment on issues that affect their state, but af you know, affect from a national uh, perspective. Recently, uh, the New Mexico Attorney General promulgated a rule that required a requires a pretty substantial uh, pre-sale inspection process and, and disclosure uh, to the consumer of any damage over 6%. It's, it's a very, um, very aggressive rule. There's significant consternation in the industry, both with uh, our state association and our members, as well as the, uh, the new car dealers as well. We had opportunity, because of this relationship, to sit down with the Attorney General of New Mexico and, and walk him through the concerns that we have, not only on behalf of the New Mexico Association, and they do a fantastic job representing themselves, but we're able to kind of uh, second the things that they're saying and also provide some national perspective. Unfortunately, Attorney General King did not um, change his mind with respect to what he had originally drafted. That rule still stands. Uh, but I can tell you that does a positive uh, development so that we're being contacted and we're interacting with these state AGs to address issues. And like Steve mentioned, the vast majority of the day-to-day -day enforcement that you see is going to come through state attorneys general. One of the things uh, that attorneys general now have in their arsenal that they did not have prior to the Dodd-Frank Act being passed is they can now bring claims under federal law, specifically the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, that didn't exist before. 
So whether those claims are brought by the CFPB or brought by the state attorney general, violations of Dodd-Frank can be enforced by both entities now. And we're seeing that come into play. The Illinois and Mississippi attorneys general here over the course of the last six, eight months have uh, started that process. The New York Banking Commission has started that process as well. There's a lot of things that we could sit and, uh, and tell you about. We wanted to give you an opportunity to, in the last couple of minutes we have, ask any questions of us that you might have. And the three of us will be here uh, throughout the week. Uh, please feel free, if we don't get an opportunity to answer your question, to come and grab us uh, throughout the week. And, and we'll be happy to fill you in on anything that, uh, that we can tell you about what's going on in Washington, D.C. There's a couple of microphones here in the, uh, the center aisle. If, does anybody have any questions that they want to come and ask? mentioned the people in Carolina that, um, that have been sued about the risk-based pricing. What, if anything, is the theory that the regulators are, or the North Carolina Attorney General is taking in bringing this suit? So the issue isn't a risk-based pricing issue. It's actually a fair lending issue um, called reverse redlining. And in essence, what, uh, what the, the suit alleges is that this particular dealer uh, concentrates, uh, his primary market is, uh, is an African-American community, and he charges everybody the exact same interest rate. So in essence, what is being alleged is, a, through anecdote, and I, I certainly don't know all the facts uh, intimately, but I've just got what's alleged in the complaint and some of the other things that I've seen. What they're alleging is that he's made some disparaging remarks. And what I like in this, if you're a sports fan and you know what's gone on with the whole Donald Sterling and Los Angeles Clippers, um, you know, he's made some private disparaging comments in a, in a private conversation, and that's being used against him now to kind of take away his, his franchise. In essence, that's kind of what the Department of Justice is alleging, is that this, this particular dealer has uh, some discriminatory uh, thoughts because he has made statements that would suggest that, that he's disparaged African Americans. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. But what they're saying is, Notwithstanding the fact everybody's getting the same interest rate, there are certain African Americans, if, if credit was being pulled, would qualify for better rates, and therefore were engaged in, in potential discrimination. Again, it, it, in my opinion, is a, is a claim that's a little bit of a stretch. There's a motion to dismiss that's pending in front of the federal judge. There are other issues, by the way. It's not just that issue. That's obviously the, the preeminent issue in the case, but there's some allegations of not complying with um, North Carolina laws that relates to repossessions and, and other things that he's supposed to be doing. But it, it's a very, um, very unique case in the theory that they're pursuing and the facts that they have uh, to pursue it on. It, it's very much a bookend of, of what the CFPB is alleging on the indirect lending side. Um, if it goes through, it, it, I think it has the potential to squeeze dealers in, in, in quite a bit. Other questions? Question in regards to the open recalls that are that are going on right now in the legislation, you know, that's forward. What does what do you guys recommend that we do currently, and are we regulated at all with the open recalls now? And is there any responsibilities we have as dealers until that legislation comes forward? NIADA uh, released kind of the best practices uh, bullet points here about a year and a half ago, and if you'll grab me afterwards, I'm happy to email that to you. There's nothing right now that prohibits the sale of a vehicle with an open recall. We would encourage uh, dealers to be cautious of what they say in representing the quality of the vehicles because if you make a representation that that vehicle is safe and it turns out that there is a, an open safety recall um, and that recall causes some issues with the safety of the car, then you've probably committed an unfair deceptive act or potentially even fraud. So. What we would suggest is that you do your best to, you know, discover those issues and if you can, fix them. But there's no prohibition as of yet for um, that prohib uh, prohibiting the sale of those vehicles. I, I kind of think that it's probably coming. I don't know if these yeah, guys yeah. have any comment on that. Yeah, and, and, and just so we're clear, the association's position on that is we're not opposed to 
complying with the, the recall situation if it deals with a matter of safety. And so long as there is proper notification to the dealers or there is a mechanism provided to the dealers so we know that there is a pending recall on a vehicle that's on the lot. Um, and, you know, this is all driven by consumer advocates. And they have, you know, I mean, they have, um, you know, um, legitimate concerns. This all goes back uh, to the to the situation with uh, the Hauk sisters where they, as I mentioned in the past, where they uh, rented a vehicle, they showed up uh, to pick up the vehicle at the airport. The two sisters, um, turns out that they were upgraded. What they weren't told is they were upgraded because it was the last vehicle on the lot and, and, the, and the vehicle was subject to a recall having to do with uh, st uh, the steering power mechanism and they drove the vehicle off the lot two hours later. Uh, the, Smoke and fire started coming from under the engine because of the steering fluid and whatever. The sister driving the car lost control of the vehicle, hit an 18-wheeler head-on, and both girls died. And that's been the that's been the issue that has been the focus in Congress. Girls were from California. Senator Boxer, who is not only chair of Environment and Public Works, she's also on the Senate Commerce Committee as well. This has been her issue all along. Um, and um, that's been the reason why this has been an issue before Congress. Seeing what we saw in the President's budget was a surprise, because we had never seen it in, 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 the, in the Congress. Um, and notwithstanding what happens at the end of the day, our position is that the, the onus is on them to demonstrate the need uh, to have this provision enacted into law, to prove the case that what's going on out there in terms of recalls are actually resulting in injuries and deaths to folks. And, and the General Motors recall issue hasn't helped. That's put a lot of pressure on members of Congress. You've seen the hearings, the back and forth. 13 deaths so far associated to that recall issue, that specific recall issue. Um, they're still doing research on it. And so far this year, there's been 13 million cars with recalls on them. So it's an issue that's gaining a lot of steam in Congress, and we're doing our best to make sure that you all don't get affected by that. And the, the word that came to us from the Commerce Committee was, look, we're going to put something in our part of MAP 21 reauthorization because, quote unquote, we have senior members of the committee who are very concerned about this issue. We will have to see what that looks like and go from there. And, and I, would, I, would just add, I would just add to that that officially the NIADA's position is we, we don't support any current legislation that would seek to, um, you know, place a, an open recall fix um, in, in, at the state level or at the federal level, not in, not in part because we don't believe we should sell cars that are safe to drive, but because it's an access to information issue. And currently, consumers um, have just as much access to the open recall data as dealers do. And, and currently, the open recall data is controlled by the federal government the OEMs and the franchise dealers. And uh, we're only getting access to it, independent dealers are only getting access to this information on a trickle down basis. Right. So until there's a level playing field where consumers and used car dealers in lockstep with OEMs and the manufacturers and the federal government can all have access at, in real time that's event specific, unfortunately, we're, we can't support any legislation that would require that. What about rental car companies that have a bunch of used cars sitting on their lots that have recalls, but they are almost forced to have to rent them out because they can't afford to let them sit? Are they opening themselves up to liability problems? Well, that, 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 that's the genesis of this whole thing, is the rental car companies. The problem is, um, you, you know, they're, they're, you go after the big boys because they have, obviously, most of the business. And um, fortunately, the way uh, the, the past legislation, proposed legislation on this issue has been drafted. It defines a rental car company as any entity that has five or more vehicles for rent. And so that picks up you know, the, some the, of our folks. The big rental car companies all agreed in a letter to Boxer. Chairman Boxer, who's from California, who started the movement where that accident occurred. Um, they all agreed in a letter that they would not rent cars that have recalls but the consumer advocates won't accept that. Right. They need a law. They, they want, want legislation. They want it enacted into law with respect, not only to the new car dealers for which it applies, but rental car dealers and probably now used car dealers. In, in the interest of time, we'll take one more question because I know we've got a very tight schedule. 
Uh, knowing that the uh, recalls are a manufacturing issue, uh, why is the onus on the dealer to fix the vehicle uh, after the recall period is expired? Should it should not legislation requiring uh, fix of the of the component be on the manufacturer, not on the dealer? That's one of the concerns that we've got with the way things are drafted right now as well, because yeah. the, the the president's language is has got no backstop to it. Um, it is if there's an open recall, it's 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 the prohibition will be on the dealer. You can't sell that until you fix it, until it is fixed. So the interesting thing is you can offer it, you can offer the vehicle for sale. You just can't yep. sell it. Can't finalize it. Yeah. <laughs> La words mean things in legislation, mm -hmm. and the words that they're using are very interesting for sure. Yeah. All right, very good. Well, join me in giving these guys a warm round of applause. These guys are working hard on your behalf, and we appreciate what you're doing.